a pioneer country, a history of Norwegian poli climate politics by Peter Ankar. Abstract, the shift away from ecology towards climatology in Norwegian environment policy in the late 1980s and 1990s was not accidental. A main mover was the Labour Party politician Gro Harlem Brundtland, who did not want to deal with unruly and highly vocal deep ecologists. Better than to start afresh with a different set of environmental scholars appealing to the technocratic tradition within the Labour Party. Instead of changing the ethical and social ways of dealing with environmental problems as the deep ecologists were advocating, she was looking for technological and economic solutions and she mobilized an international regime of carbon capture storage, CCS, tradable carbon emissions quota, TEQs, and clean development mechanisms, CDMs, all of which eventually were approved in Kyoto in 1997. This move towards technocracy and cost-benefit economics reflects a post-Cold War turn towards utilitarian capitalism, but also a longing to showcase Norway as an environmental pioneer country to the world. The underlying question was how to reconcile the nation's booming petroleum industry with reduction in climate gas emissions. Should the oil and gas stay underground and the country strive towards the ec ecologically informed zero growth society the deep ecologists were envisioning? Or could growth in the petroleum industry take place without harming the environment as the Labour Party environmentalists argued? The summer of 1989 was unusually hot in Norway and the sweltering heat wave provided a ammunition for a parliamentary argument about global warming. The Prime Minister and the former chair of the World Commission on Environment and Development, Gro Harlem Brundtland, pushed hard for an ambitious program aimed at stabilizing carbon emissions by the 1990s. Her goal was to prove that to the world that Norway took our common future, 1987, and its quest for sustainable development seriously. For Bretland, this was no minor topic. She was up for re-election that fall, for, and for more than one-third of the Norwegian electorate. Sorry about that. Environmental concerns were the most important issue in de deciding whom they would vote for. Ardell and Henry, 1995, page 19. Brentland used environmental concerns to push her success in this realm and sway voters to vote for her. But why global warming? This paper will examine Norwegian climate politics and policy in the late 1980s and 1990s and attempt to explain the shift from a focus on ecology towards climate in the late 1980s. There were still valid scientific questions being raised in the scientific community with respect to the evidence provided by climatologists Wirt 2003, Fleming 2005, Edwards 2010. In addition to the Norwegian environmentalists through concern, though concerned about global warming, were pushing politicians to address ecological depletion first. As will be argued, the political shift away from ecology towards climatology was not accidental. To Brundtland, the ecological approach meant having to negotiate with the unruly and highly vocal deep ecologists. She decided it was better than to start afresh with a different set of environmental scholars who would appeal to the technocratic and macroeconomic tradition of the Labour Party. Instead, the changing of the changing the ethical and social ways of dealing with environmental economic solutions. As a result, the, she mobilized an international regime of carbon capture, storage, CCS, tradable carbon emissions quotas, TEQs, and clean development mechanisms, CDMs, all of which eventually were approved in Kyoto in 1997. This move towards technocracy and cost effective or I'm sorry, cost-benefit economics reflects a post-Cold War 
turn towards utilitarian and capitalism, but also, I, as I will argue, a longing to showcase Norway as an environmental pioneer country to the world. The underlying question was how to reconcile the nation's booming petroleum industry with a reduction of, in climate gas emissions should the oil and gas stay underground and the country strive towards the ecologically informed zero growth society with society the deep ecologists were envisioning or could growth in the petroleum industry take place without harming the environment as the labor party environmentalist argued one deep the deep ecologists in 1971 in norway's Nor largest tabloid newspaper a journalist reported that global warming quote may cause the polar ice to melt that the ocean will rise above its shores that cities and large territories of land will be underwater, and that humans will be displaced to mountain regions, unquote. Anonymous, 1971. This alarming news story, possibly the first reference to issue of global warming in Norwegian press, was buried in a host of similar stories of doom and gloom. Since Earth Day a year before, readers had become used to hearing about a fast-approaching environmental Ragnarok this was alarming news to Norwegians who would typically spend their vacations enjoying the country's beautiful fjords and mountains. Indeed, in the 1970s, only 16% of the population did not regularly take part in outdoor life, and this group consisted mostly of the elderly, Central Bureau of Statistics, 1970. The press was nurtured with stories of environmental doom by a highly effective environmental organization called the co-working group for the protection of nature and the environment known in the english-speaking literature as the deep ecologist they found each other thanks to the exhibition and after us created by students of the o oslo school of architecture in june 1969 it was a highly popular traveling exhibition about the echo crisis seen by 80,000 people in oslo alone here, the designers draw, drew atten attention to the possibility of children after us, unquote, having no natural environment in each which to live, anonymous 1970. Dramatic graphic design crystallized a clear message about the environment after us, unquote. Either being in a state of disaster or a harmonious, balanced ecosystem, thanks to the deep ecologist, this either-or dichotomy between the, a future of industrial doom or ecological bliss came to, be, came to dominate the environmental debate in Norway in the following decade. The deep ecologists gained a significant following among activists seeking radicalism within acceptable socio-political boundaries of the Cold War, Anchor, 19, or Anchor 2007. Though self-fashioned self as Echo radicals, their concerns had to be taken seriously by politicians. Interest in environmental issues would fluctuate from year to year and typically be of key importance for environmental issues would fluctuate from oh, I'm so sorry. From year to year and typically be of key importance for environmental issues would fluctuate from year to year and typically Oh my goodness gracious, I'm so sorry and typically be of key importance for environmental why is it doing that for this oh my goodness gracious i'm so sorry for the swing voters who made up roughly 10 percent of the country's electorate from the 1970s and the swing voters who made up roughly 10 percent of the country's electorate from the 1970s and onward organized by the charismatic philosopher sigmund Cavoli. The Deep Ecologist became a hard-hitting populist association, which at its peak in the late 1970s was one of the lar largest and certainly most vocal environmental organizations in Norway, attacking large, I'm sorry, attacking industrialization and economic growth, particularly hydropower developments. Their formative experience was their attempt to save the Mardola waterfall from hydropower development during the summer of 1970. As Norway's highest waterfall and the fourth highest in the world, its future became a symbol of the nation. Thanks to the well-organized 
deep ecologist, the demonstration evolved into a dramatic yet st still strictly nonviolent civil disobedience sit-in. I'm so sorry. In the event, in the end, the demonstrators either left voluntarily or, as is in the case of Cavalli and the his philosophy teacher, Aim Nice, were carried away by the police. For more than a decade, the Mardolo demonstration was known as the defining event for environmentalism in Norway, in which taking a stand on hydropower development separated friends from foes. The vocal deep ecologist would set the stage for environmental debate in Norway with non-compromising positions cast in Cold War bipolar terms as either deep or shallow, unquote. They confronted Gro Harlem Brundtland head on in her capacity as Minister of the Environment between 1974 and 1979. She was most definitely defined shallow, something they would never let her forget. With major discoveries of oil in the North Seas, the deep ecologists would fervently protest against further exploration on the grounds that oil and gas would take Norway for further away from deep eco-political path and instead towards the destructive forces of capitalism, economic growth, and exploitation of natural resources. More specifically, petroleum would cause carbon dioxide emissions and the so-called greenhouse effect, unquote, would lead to a dramatic rise in, in sea level. Bernstead, 1978. In April 1977, the chief pipeline in an oil platform called Bravo exploded, causing a week-long major oil spill. This put Brentland under an unwanted spotlight with national and week-long and international media covering the evolving disaster on an hourly basis. To the deep ecologist shouting bravo, bravo, unquote, the oil spill was evidence of a failed policy of economic growth endorsed by a minister of the environment not worthy of her title. The tensions between the deep ecologist and the government culminated with what became the most dramatic civil disobedience demonstration in post-war Nor Norwegian history. The effort to save the Alta Kutakino waterway in the north of Norway from hydropower development Hydrothal 2006 after an application process that began in 1968. The Norwegian parliament part voted in 1978 in favor of the project thanks to the support from the Labour Party. As Minister of the Environment and sus subs subsequently as Prime Minister from February to October 1981, Brentland had wholeheartedly defended the project. The deep ecologists were furious. It is time for another Man Mardola demonstration, unquote. They challengingly questioned the issue at stake was not only saving a truly pristine environment, but also defending the civil rights of the indigenous Semi population who lived and worked in the landscape to construct or not construct the dam was, was the question. Which cast the debate on dichotomy that left little room for the political middle ground of the Labour Party. By the summer of 1979, demonstrators were in place blocking the construction site, where they stayed until the fall of 1981, when the largest police operation in the, unit, in the nation's history removed the strictly nonviolent but very determined deep ecologist. These events occupied the country's environmental and social debates, often as front page news. Yet for all efforts of the demonstrators, the police operations put an effective end to the demonstrations in 1982. The Supreme Court ruled the project lawful and the deep ecologists reluctantly gave up the fight. Labor Party environmentalism. Although she was despised by the deep ecologists, it is important to understand why the Brentland was regarded as a committed environmentalist among her peers. The Labor Party was known for her scientific and te technocratic ways of handling issues regarding both humans and nature. Brunlin would continue the party's technocratic tradition, and even though she belonged to an emerging group of reformists within the party, expressing concerns about the social and environmental cost of the economic growth. 
One key mover from among the Labour Party environmentalists was the was Alife Dahl, a professor of botany who was inspired by the American ecologist Eugene P. Odom. Dahl was the first to introduce ecology as a research topic through his lectures at the Norwegian Ar Agricultural College in 1963. Throughout the 1960s, he addressed environmental problems head on from within the Labour Party, arguing that politicians and scientists alike were much too focused on producing products to live on, unquote, instead of a good environment to live in, unquote. Brentland knew Dahl and his work well. She took her medical exams at the University of Oslo in 1963 and earned a Master of Public Health from Harvard University in 1965. In Norway, she was known for fighting for women's rights for abortion, a struggle that was particularly intense in debates leading up to the Norwegian Law of Self-Determination of 1975. Brentland was socially in the midst of these events, which led her to the view science to view scientists and experts with some skepticism in the abortion debate she noted experts unquote were presenting a mixture of facts and personal beliefs unquote in a way in which they abused knowingly or unknowingly their expert or scientific role in a political context unquote as a young feminist she was chosen to become minister of the environment her experience as a decision and as a supporter of women's rights to choose framed ways framed the ways in which she engaged with natural scientists on environmental issues politics is like preventative health care unquote she said Brentland quoted in hansen and tegan 1992 page 38 she transferred decision making about a patient's body to the body politic she saw herself as a former scientist able to read complicated scientific papers, yet she had been able to finish her doctoral dissertation. Indeed, her sole academic publication was a historical study of medical records. She argued that right knowledge would lead to right action. She recognized that different scientific specialists could have competing explanations of reality, and it was therefore of key importance to find scientific generalists with the ability to translate and mediate clusters of rel relevant facts to politicians. The problem of which expert one should to listen to, unquote, was a matter of willingness to base decisions upon scientific uncertainty, which was normal in the medical treatment of patients. It was based on this argument of risk that she would argue from the rostrum of the parliament in 1975 that the environmental effect of resource exhaustion and pollution would set finite, finite role limits to growth in the use of energy in the world. This framing of the issue was a, was a not so subtle reference to the limits to growth report for the Club of Rome. One of the authors of this report was the 27 year old Norwegian solid state physicist Horin I'm sorry, Jorgen Randers. When he moved to back to Oslo in 1974, after four remarkable years as a graduate student and subsequently as a professor at MIT, he became four. He became a key Labour Party environmentalist. Yet he received a cold reception upon his return and was denied academic jobs. And he was deemed a quote shallow te technocrat by deep ecologists who were in control of hiring for environmental positions at the universities in order to find an income he started the resource policy group and made himself the director the group's program okay pragmatic statement came in the report a quest for a sustainable society which incidentally was an early appearance of the word sustainable in the title of the publication addressed environmental issues here ranchers argued that made the major goal of the sustainable society is to deliver to the next generation a carrying capacity better than the one inherited from the past it was these ideas about the sustainability that randers 
brought to Brundtland and the Labour Party, who secured him the financial backing to run his resource policy group for funding from the Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish research councils. Brundtland saw herself as a leader of a large movement fighting for social and environmental justice, and Randers became an important voice in deciding how to proceed. The Brundtland Commission, by 1982, Brundtland had won the battle but lost the war with the deep ecologists. The oil spill of 1977 can still continued to haunt her. And as prime minister, she pushed for developing hydropower at the Alta River at the expense of losing her environmental credibility among voters. The new conserv conservative government that replaced her in the fall of 1981 would gleefully acknowledge the importance of national parks and point out the failures of the Calius technocratic planners within the Labour Party. The opportunity to recast herself as a true environmentalist came when Brundtland was asked to chair the World Commission on Environmental De and Development in 1984. There is no need to review its history here, as a recent historical study has covered much of the material. In her capacity as chair, she was able to mobilize the language of sustainability she got from Randers. Despite a d decade filled with criticisms from the deep ecologists, it is important to note that she did, did share the same dream of harmony within humankind, as well as between humans and the environment. By the 1980s, Randers' vision for a sustainability society, she also began to take on a life of its own. One early approach was the anthology, The Sustainable Society, Impl Implications for Limited Growth. And Lester Brown, the director of the World Watch Institute, introduced the Sustainability Society in a book to a larger audience in 1981. Around the same time, biologists began using the word sustainable as a descriptive term for processes in nature. Internal reports by the World Bank, the International Union for Protection of Nature and the World Wildlife Fund also used it in the early 1980s, and in 1984, the term was used again as a subtitle on the State of the World Report. To achieve sustainability, the wor world would need to practice development that, quote, meets the needs for th of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, unquote. As the World Commission would define the term sustainable d development in its report, th the importance of global warming came to the forefront of Brenton, Brentland and the World Commission's attention in a written submission to the public hearing in Ottawa in 1986 by the climatologist Kenneth Hare at the University of Toronto. What caught Brentland's interest were, were not the catastrophic predicted consequences of climate change. Ecological doom was old news to her, as the deep ecologist for a decade had provided her with a stream of reports on the proximity of a civilization collapse. What was intriguing, however, was the possibility of moving the environment debate into a new scientific domain, and perhaps in the process of creating a new global political regime that would speak to the patron of the Commission of the United Nations. Thus, their report, Our Common Future, spelled out the d dangers of global warming by presenting the problem as one of the world's chief environmental challenges. Brentland received only half-hearted applause when she, represent when she presented the report at home. The bitterness from Alta was still lingering among environmentalists during her second period as Prime Minister. That she would enjoy fame as an environmentalist abroad the abroad chairing the World Commission was understood among the deep ecologists as ironic at best. The initial reactions to our common future among eco-philosophers were therefore to ignore Brentland's role and assume that the report was written by someone else. Cavalloy, for example, did not mention her in the his review of it, in which he argued that the report supported his own theories about the inevitable ecological collapse of the industrial world. Bretland, however, made it perfectly clear in the media that she, as the Prime Minister, stood by the, the report, though few environmentalists took her seriously. A sustainable climate, number four. 
One of Brundtland's top priorities after the publication of Our Common Future in 1987 was to issue a white paper that would flatten criticisms at home that the Labor Party did not take the environment seriously. When sent for parliamentary approval, Brundtland, as prime minister, put her full force behind it. She was determined to silence opponents and put both herself and the Labor Party on the environmental offensive before the 1989 election. At the core of environment and development, as the white paper was entitled, was the vision of Norway as a driving force and, quote, a pioneer country. For Environmental Change Ministry of the, of the Environment 1989, Norway was to show the world the path towards a sustainable society. This was part of Brundtland's foreign policy agenda to establish Norway as a humanitarian superpower, unquote. In the world, the, the white paper addressed key issues related to our common future, such as the need to protect biodiversity, minimize acid rain, and ozone layer depletion and protect the well oceans, protect the oceans as well as the importance of public transportation and the need for financial support of developing countries. It also promised to reorganize and strengthen Norway's environmental agencies and perhaps most exciting for academic community, in increase research funds. Yet climate change was at the forefront of the environment and development labeled as perhaps the most pressing environmental issue for the 1990s. And Brundtland was determined to do something about it. She asked the parliament to approve the policy, to approve a policy that would reduce the CO2 emissions so that they would stabilize in the 1990s and in year 2000 at the latest, unquote. Thereafter, the policy stated that the emissions were to subside Ministry of the Environment 1989 the opposition naturally ridiculed this ambition was as unnecessary and unfounded in scientific facts. With the most vicious attacks coming from scholars on the political far left, who claimed they were shocked by the ignorance, bluffs, and partly dishonest use of data among climatologists. To counter such claims, Brundtland initiated research programs in two new centers, Center for Development and the Environmental Sum, I'm sorry, SUM, and a Center for an International Climate Environmental Research, OSLA, CIC Cicero. The task of these centers was to provide scientists to the politicians they were to do their own research, as well as digest and summarize other research on how to realize the World Commission's vision for sustainable development, unquote, in Norway and beyond. Though officially independent, Labor Party environmental politics politics would in both in both subtle and not so subtle ways frame research agendas at both centers for example a portrait of Brentland hung prominently in the meeting area of some and indeed still hanging in its director's office and hands-on chairman of its board Hans Christian Busch was one of her accolades Back in 1977, he was one of the principal authors of the Norwegian official report that vindicated Brundtland from a, any responsibility for the Bravo oil spill, despite claims to the contrary from the deep ecologist. Center for the Development and the Center, I'm sorry, Center for Development and the Environment was not created from scratch, but instead took over and absorbed the Council for Nature and Environmental Studies that had been active at the University of Oslo since 1972. The council had been the bulwark of deep ecology scholar activism as longtime opponents of Brundtland and her environmental policies. Its researchers found this or reorganization or reorganizing chal yeah, challenging. Soon tensions and dis disagreements emerged with respect to action research and the role of ecology in envisioning a, a sustainable future. Should the center question the deeper foundations of society or simply generate ec ecological facts to bring to the political table? Unable to find a clear answer, environmental research at the center became marginalized by its chairman through the end of the 1990s. During this period, an aging 
Nace was the only scholar from the council who stayed put in his office. To new scholars moving in, he was a charming emblem of the past with a ring of fame around him that was suitable for generating public attention. At the Center for International Climate and Environmental Research, the story was different. Its first chairman was Enric Auger Hansen. He had served as vice president of the all-dominating state-owned Norwegian oil company, Statol, State Oil, for 24 years and had just stepped down in order to be the company's chief advisor on environmental policy. His role was to make that sure that the climate research at Cicero would not undermine the nation's booming petroleum industry. Cicero's first director, Ted ha Hansik, was a keen supporter of Brundtland, serving as her parliamentary secretary from 1986 to 1989. This close link to the Labor Party and state oil was not accidental. The aim for Cicero was to envision a way forward to ambitious Norwegian climate politics to exist in harmony with oil and gas exploitation. With these new research centers, were in the process of establishing themselves other large research programs began investigating climate change. The Norwegian Research Council for Sciences and Humanities, NAVF, and the European Science Foundation, ESF, arranged a large conference to kickstart such research in Europe. It happened in the Norwegian city of Bergen in 1990, in lieu of the regional conference addressing the World Commission's Our Common Future. Most of the European environmental ministries attended this meeting in order to prepare the for, for the forthcoming Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. Politically, the conference was a failure. As the miners attempted to take the bus to their hotel in order to showcase public transportation, but were blocked by environmentalists. With the activists shouting, Bergen meeting, talking and eating, the ministers were struck, stuck for more than an hour, after which they led, had to run the gauntlet among the activists in order to get to their meeting rooms. The police did not intervene as they were set, settling scores with local politicians who had accused them of, of being violent in an unrelated case. Among the 138 scientists attending the conference, it was pronounced to show that they were not only, quote, talking and eating, but actually contributing. The result was a thick anthology, anthology produced with great speed in which climate change was at the forefront. It included conclusions and recommendations for politicians preparing for the Earth Summit in Rio, stating that climate change was real and that the way forward was in the domain of international laws, as well as in using cost-effective financial initiatives to curb and emissions of greenhouse gases. All this was happening during the year that Brentland's government was in opposition to the ruling conservatives. The Labor Party, however, regained power in the fall of 1990 for her third term as Prime Minister. Brentland appointed Thorbjörn Bernstein as the new Minister of the Environment. Known by friends and foes as, quote, the slugger, unquote, he was a man of action and a clear sign that Brundtland was determined to reach her ambitious goal of stabilizing Norway's climate emissions by the millennium. Yet the prop prospect of curbing glo the emissions that had appeared feasible in 1989 looked overambitious by 1990. What had changed was the gradual realization that reducing emissions was not possible at the <coughs> excuse me same time as dramatically increasing the nation's oil and gas production how could one increase production and spur economic growth while also finding a way to reduce emissions or in the language of our common future how could one meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations Brentland appointed the leader of the labor party's youth wing John Stoltenberg to be the parliamentary and undersecretary at the Ministry of the Environment and the slugger delegated this difficult question to him. At the time, Stoltenberg was 31 years old and working for Statistics Norway. He had, back in 1985, completed his candidatus, 
I'm sorry, it's Oka Mises, it's economics, degree at the University of Oslo, which was a specially designed master degree for talented students of microeconomics. While students at other departments would be required to study different fields, this economics degree stood out as its students were allowed to focus on economics for five years. The Department of Economics, it is worth noting, was the very jewel of University of Oslo, with two former Nobel laureates and an intense research tradition. It's, it is a department from which historically many of Norway's leading bureaucrats and politicians have emerged. Despite their talents, the economist had since the 1970s hardly been a productive force with respect to environmental issues. With the deep ecologist framing the debate, economists were asked whether or not to it was possibly to put a monetary value on wilderness. It was not. <clears throat> and were asked to find a path towards developing an alternative non-growth ecologically informed econ economy. These were large problems to which the econ economist provided few answers. However, things changed with regards to climate research. There has been more of a tradition of mathematical modeling in climate research than in the life of sciences, which may perhaps explain why the economists rose to the podium with mathematical solutions to climate change. In any case, Stoltenberg saw in global warming an opportunity to engage the technocratic and ma macroeconomic tradition of the Labor Party. Historically, the Department of Economics in Oslo has been decidedly leftist with John Maynard Keynes as their protagonist and Milton Friedman as the antagonist. Stoltenberg was and was no exception. His thesis macroeconomic planning under uncertainty was about developing an optimal plan for the nation's oil revenue. The thesis is today widely accepted as the very architecture of what became the government pension fund of Norway, known simply as the oil fund which by 2011 evolved into the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, holding more than 1% of the global equity market. Stoltenberg, 1985, Reinerson, 2009. Excuse me. In 1990, Stoltenberg knew what was worth knowing about the past, present, and future of Norway's oil economy. And he was a keen proponent of exponential growth of its industry. He was also an outsider I'm sorry, an outdoor enthusiast, an ardent hiker and cross-country skier. And he did not take <clears throat> environmental issues and global warming lightly. Indeed, he would, as Norway's prime minister from 2005 to 2013, view global warming next to poverty as the main challenge of our time, unquote. And he would restate Brundtland's vision that Norway, with regard to environmental policy, was to be a pioneer for the world. Vixine, 2011. However, the question remained of how one could nurture Norway's oil and gas exploitation while at the same time curbing the world's greenhouse emissions. Stoltenberg brought that, the question to his former student friends and professors at the Department of Economics while also getting input from Hanish and his colleagues from the Cicero at the time, a growing body of literature on environmental cost-benefit economics had emerged. Drawing on this, and inspired by the U.S. emissions trading system for sulfur dioxide quotas, Stoltenberg came to the conclusion that the most cost-effective way of reducing gas, greenhouse gases without having to curb oil protection would be to introduce a similar system to the U.S. sulfur dioxide quotas for greenhouse gases in Europe and perhaps the entire world. With plenty of money from the oil, Norway could then buy such quotas and thereby reach its millennium goal. There was only one problem. They would first have to establish an emission market supported by an international regime. Thanks to the remarkable work by current historians, there is now a viable account of what happened next. Martiniusen in the years, I'm sorry, 2013, in the years leading up to the Earth Summit in Rio, Norway engaged in an intense diplomatic campaign led by Stoltenberg's father, 
Trajan Stoltenberg, who was Brundtland's Minister of Foreign Affairs. In keeping with the division of labor between scientists and politicians that Brundtland had suggested, the actual traveling was done by professional diplomats, mostly Stoltenberg's senior, Deputy Secretary Kerbrun, who was as assisted by Harold de Vold and Justine Lura, they met much resistance in European countries who argued that Norway should perhaps curb its own emissions instead of buying the achievement of others. The reception was not much better in newly industrialized countries such as India, Thailand, and Malaysia. When Brundtland, Bernstein, and Stoltenberg Jr. traveled to Rio in 1992, to promote the idea, they too failed to convince the world about the virtue of carbon emission trading. The Rio delegates had widely diverse opinions about how to achieve sustainability development in reality and could consequently only agree on the importance of biodiversity. Yet the meeting was not an entire failure with regards to climate change and carbon emissions. As it established the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCCC. Back in Oslo, the Norwegian diplomats concluded that they would have to show that Norway would be willing to cut some of its emissions to, at home, at the same time mustering support from the developing world for the carbon quotas. At homes in Norway, carbon capture and storage technology, CCS, became the designated approach to achieve the Millennium Goal. The basic idea was to replace oil with carbon dioxide when producing oil in the North Sea, and there was a government tax in place to act as a financial incentive to target such emissions from the petroleum industry. Stratlenberg argued that if Norway was able to capture and store greenhouse gases deep in the continental shelf, it should count towards climate gas reduction. In 1996, Statoy's Sleipner platform became the world's first offshore CCS's plant to inject carbon dioxide into the oil reservoirs through the platform would still be one of the single largest climate gas polluters in Norway. Finding technological solutions to social problems was very much in the labor tradition and CCS's became the party's most ambitious anti-global warming initiative at home. In his New Year's speech in 2007, Stoltenberg announced that to the nation that Norway's equivalent moon landing would be to develop CCS technologies for its petroleum industry. Attempt failed financially, however, and then backfired on a prime minister who soon faced criticism for his own state-driven innovation policies, along with numerous moon landing jokes. On the international scene, Norway tried to muster votes from developing world in order to get acceptance for emissions tradings before the scheduled meeting in Kyoto in 1997. After Rio, Norwegian diplomats spent a large t amount of time trying to convince the leaders of the world's poorest nations of the virtues of carbon emissions trading. While they suggested that was a system in which a rich country would pay for a carbon clean development initiative in a poor country and then get credit for it in their carbon account at home. For example, if Norway installed solar cells in sunny Burkina Fosco, they could get carbon emission credit for the project in Norway. This would benefit both rich countries and poor countries in different ways, it creates a state of interdependence and mutualism. To prove their sincerity, Norway actually did install such cells and got Burkina Faso's vote in Kyoto in return. Between 1992 and 1997, Norway did numerous projects like these in the developing world mustering support for what would eventually be called Clean Development Mechanisms or CDMs. CDMs also meant increasing businesses in Norway as one of the nation's more obscure industries is certification provided by Det Norske Varetes DNV, which is one of the three large classification companies in the world, the others being Lloyd Register 
and the American Bureau of Shipping. With more than 10,000 employees, DNV is a voice to be reckoned within a small no nation. For them, the clean development mechanisms meant big money and more jobs, as every CDM project had to meticulously researched and certified. Stoltenberg visited the DMV headquarters and promoted, I'm sorry, promised jobs and even appeared in their intramural news bulletin. He would later take pride in having developed or having helped DMV to become the largest CDM certifier in the world. By 1997, Norway had secured votes from developing nations with the help of CDM test projects, and Norwegian developments arrived in Kyoto, confident of the outcome. In United Nations, in, <coughs> excuse me, international agreements, every vote is equal, whether you request the rep whether you represent the United States or Antigua, Belize, or Guyana the last three being allies of Norway. As a result, in Kyoto, many countries committed to reducing greenhouse emissions. They could do so in three different ways. At home, by tra trading carbon dioxide equivalent quotas to EQs and by buying clean development mechanisms, certificates, CDMs. Soon the European Union established a market for emission trading and the certification industry began issuing purchasable CDM certificates based on projects mostly located in the developing world. Despite being a significant buyer in these mar new markets, Norway never met its millennium goal from 1989 at, as it its greenhouse gas emissions increased. The income from, from exports of petroleum never came close to the expense of importing CDMs, of course, but the financial cost of these Tradable emissions quotas never was nevertheless significant over the years. Yet to understand this endeavor only in terms of economic efficiency would be to miss the point. What was the was important to the Labor Party environmentalist was to showcase Norway as a virtuous pioneer country, both to us both to its own citizens and to the world promoting Sustainable development was, this paper has indicated, a way of reforming the Labor Party's technocratic tradition in order to be viewed in a more environmentally friendly light. And the ultimate contradiction was that it was all paid for by the production of the very close of the very cause of global warming, petroleum. Five Coda, par Paris, 2015. Current affairs are not per a product of history, though the above discussion may shed light on what happened next. Both in Norway and at the Climate Change Conference in Paris of 2015, the Labour Party was replaced by a new Conservative government in 2013, after Stoltenberg continued to promote carbon capture and storage technologies, CCSs, along with tradable energy quotas to EQs and clean development mechanisms, CDMs, in his capacity as a United Nations Special Envoy on Climate Change and Chair of the High Level Adversary Advisory Group on Climate Change Financing from 2013 until till March of 2014. Though his tenure was short, his technocratic and macroeconomic approach laid the ground for the direction of the Paris negotiation. In his more recent capacity as Secretary General of NATO, he has put the damaging effect of carbon emissions on the agenda when evaluating military operations and he sees climate change as one of the many factors that may lead to future warfare. With the introduction of the new conservative government that replaced Stoltenberg in 2013, there has been renewed climate debate in Norway the high middle ground of the Labour Party's climate politics described in his paper has been called into question by conservatives and environmental activists alike. The conservatives are skeptical at this, of the state being involved in new inventions, finance and the ownership of carbon capture and storage technologies, CCSs, and they are questioning the purchase of the very hallmark of Stoltenberg's climate policy clean development mechanisms, CDMs. On the other hand, the conservatives 
have taken activists by surprise by embracing the climate politics of the European Union. Norway will be the Union's pioneer country. The Conservatives now argue by cutting its emissions at home and through Europe's emission trading systems by as much as 40% by 2030. The same time many activists have lost faith in market mechanisms such as tradable energy quotas to EQs. Instead, they have found inspiration in groups like 340.org who pitch capitalism versus climate and demand full divestment from fossil fuels. These activists argue that Norway should drastically cut emissions at home, divest from its fossil fuel industry, stop giving licenses for oil and gas explorations, and embrace carbon clean renewable energy. They were recently successful in their divest, divest campaign with the parliament voting in favor of an $8 billion divestment of the pension fund from coal mining companies. The outcome was chiefly due to the 350.org's campaign. In Paris, Norway was among the countries pushing for a strong climate change deal. The conservatives wanted the best of both worlds to maintain Norway's image of being the world's environmental pioneer country, while at the same time boosting the petroleum industry. Here are the references for this article. Thank you.